and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite-sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology, rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture and where you can see these represented in modern day content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. As you can probably tell, I've managed to catch the flu and I'm not particularly well. However, the show must go on. I'm sorry already for my terribly sick voice, but I caught it at a very silly ABBA tribute weekend at a hen party on a boat in Birmingham, which was great fun, but in hindsight, I am sad that I caught this. But the positive was is that I've managed to bash out two episodes and they are pre-written, so yay. I just can't record them right now because I sound like this, so unfortunately, this is what you get. I say all of this though and I still had a really great time and I love Abba and my cousin who's getting married and honestly I would fight anyone who does not sing along to SOS with the Pierce Brosnan voice from Mamma Mia which is what me and my two sisters and mum were doing very embarrassingly loud so maybe that's to attribute the sore throat but we'll find out. But instead of the dreary English Midlands, I'd prefer to picture myself on a day cruise driving down the Nile, looking over to see the Great Pyramid of Giza, sitting next to our monster of the week. Yes, we are over in Egypt this week for a wonder we now only see in limestone, the incredible Riddling Sphinx. Most people already know the myth of the Sphinx and know what they look like as they're an incredibly well-known monster in our roster. But for those that don't, the Sphinx is generally described as a half-woman, half-lion, and more specifically, a beautiful woman's face, a lion's body, with a snake's tail and eagle's wings. They are known to be extremely large and foreboding, with a wingspan of at least 40 feet, and as tall as 20 feet, and they could fly with said wings, so look out for giant sphinxes. Sphinxes are able to speak all human languages and are incredibly intelligent, generally considered to have even more than a genius IQ. They are also known to be extremely territorial and merciless to all those that come into their space, but due to their high intelligence, they stand out as a monster, as they would ask the invader a riddle in order to prove their worth. If the person answered correctly, they were able to pass and the Sphinx was often known to commit suicide upon mental defeat. However, if the person failed to answer correctly, they would be torn limb from limb with lion claws and eaten on the spot. Sphinxes were also considered to be the perfect guardians because of this skill and the difficulty of their riddles. Also, it meant that if they failed in their task to protect the thing they were guarding, they would kind of take care of themselves in terms of punishment. Sphinxes were great guardians mostly though because they also really just preferred to sit down and not do literally anything else. So once they were plonked in front of a tomb or a treasure vault, they would generally remain there for as long as humanly possible. They are immortal beings, however not invulnerable. They can be killed by usual human means but good luck doing that when they're five times the size of you and are a merciless hunter. They can go for decades without eating, and when they do, it's a usual lion's diet. Anything meaty, and most likely a large prey item such as a human or mammal that crosses their path. Sphinxes were not known to reproduce, and depending on what mythology you're looking at them through, there was only one in existence. Speaking of which, probably one of the most debated questions about the Sphinx is where it is actually from. It's a good trick question for a pub quiz, and one that very often trips people up. 
the Sphinx is actually known for being a member of both the Egyptian and Greek myths. However, which one came first and which one does it actually come from? Well, my friends, the answer is still debated, but experts think this was originally an Egyptian monster, which was then adapted by the Greeks. The Sphinx that we know from media and history is that of a female beast, and the Egyptian telling is that they are always male, without wings, and that they are representatives of the pharaoh themselves. Hence why, if you look at the architectural wonder of the actual physical Sphinx in Cairo, you'll see that it's male, and it even once had a beard before erosion. However, in Greek myth, the Sphinx does have a whole myth involving her, hence the popularity and the default image of them in our media and history being female and winged. Now, let's move on to etymology. The word Sphinx is also Greek. It comes from the root word Sphingo, meaning to squeeze or to tighten up, which we believe is inspired by the way that lions kill their prey, by strangulation and then biting their neck and holding them down till death. However, because of the location debate, there is also a belief that the word is actual Egyptian, from the word Sheshkipan, which means living image, referring to them being statues, but not cut from their original source rock, which is the case with the Sphinx in Cairo, as it was built from the original rock rather than placed on top of it. I'm going on about the location thing, but that's because it really shapes how we look at this monster. Their histories are actually slightly different depending on what mythos you look at. So we'll start first with the Egyptians, as we believe that this one came first. The ancient Egyptians had these creatures built into statues as early as the Bronze Age, which was between 3300 and 1200 BC first we know of was built in 2723 BC and depicted a female pharaoh, Queen Hetaferes II. Unfortunately, we're not sure where the Sphinx comes from within their mythology other than as an architectural feature and as a representative of royalty and the pharaoh, so in terms of when they first appeared, we assume that the first time they were created was around the time of this first statue. The Great Sphinx, which still stands mostly intact in Cairo, was built not long after, in 2558 BC, and it is the oldest known monumental sculpture in history. It stands at 241 feet long, 63 feet wide and 66 feet tall, and it's only really missing a few chunks, but most famously, its nose and its beard. It is also a guardian of a tomb, but we are yet to uncover all of its secrets out of fear of structural integrity and fear that we might damage the iconic sculpture. The Greeks were equally as impressed by the Great Sphinx and were very intertwined with the Egyptians as ancient cultures go and they first made good relations around the same time within the Bronze Age. They loved the idea of this guardian monster, and good old Pliny the Elder, who is one of our favourite Greek philosophers, even wrote about the Great Sphinx in his famous book, Natural Histories, back in 79 AD, stating that the Egyptians looked upon the statue as a divinity that had been passed over in silence, and that King Hermes was buried in it. The Greeks were so inspired that they borrowed the Sphinx from the Egyptians for one of the most famous epic plays of all time, Oedipus, whilst always stating that this monster very much came from Egypt and Ethiopia. They never claimed it for themselves, which go the Greeks. In this version, the Sphinx was a demon of destruction and bad luck, and generally was always covered in gore. She was the only Sphinx child of the monster mother of Greek mythology, Echidna, or possibly Ceto, one of the sea goddesses, and Orthrus, a multi-headed dog like his sibling, the guardian of Hades, Cerberus, who 
who was also mothered by Echidna, making the Sphinx a kind of incest monster, which wasn't massively unusual within Greek mythology. This Sphinx was sworn to block the path from Ethiopia to Thebes in Greece, and one of these people trying to get past was Oedipus, the shamed and self-blinded Greek king, exiled for marrying his mother and killing his father. The Sphinx was tasked to ask two riddles, the first being one of the most recognised riddles in history. Which creature has one voice, and yet becomes four-footed, two-footed and three-footed throughout its life? The answer which Oedipus gave was man, who crawls on four legs as a baby, two as a man and three as an elder. The Sphinx, infuriated, asks him another. There are two sisters. One gives birth to the other, and she, in turn, gives birth to the first. Who are the two sisters? The answer Oedipus gave was the day and the night, with each sun and moonrise as the birth of the other. Bested, the Sphinx threw herself from the path into the crashing rocks beneath the cliff. There are other tellings of this myth. For example, the very slight adaptation is that the Sphinx devoured herself in a little shame protest. But in both tellings, the death of the Sphinx is meant to represent the transition between the death of the Titans and the rise of the new Olympian gods. In another retelling, Oedipus doesn't even answer the riddles, and the Sphinx tells him the answers so that she will stop killing others, and to force her to kill herself, and to make him love her. He leaves without thanking her for the answer, and she ascends to the heavens with Anubis, the god of the dead in Egyptian mythology. The Sphinx has been continued to be used in modern media and architecture, and is used in the Freemasons to this day to represent mystery, and is often engraved or printed onto their most important documents. They are most commonly used in French Renaissance art, as they were really common within the Baroque era, with sphinxes commonly used as palace garden statues to represent a higher class protection. The writer Oscar Wilde loved the French version of the sphinx so much, he wrote a poem about them, chasing a man who is anxious about a beast following him. The riddle of the Sphinx as a thing in itself and the man riddle are some of the most recognisable parts about the Sphinx, with even not mythology fans knowing what both are and where they both came from, although I'd be impressed if anyone with no mythology, classics or theatre interest knew the story of Oedipus beyond the Freudian mother-loving reference. We do, of course, also have the Sphinx cats, which are the hairless breed of cats, which I think look like little naked old men, but are also super cute. They were officially named after the Sphinx monster in the 1960s, although it was more of a nod to a mythical cat more than anything to do with their intelligence. Not that I'm saying Sphinx cats are dumb, but cats aren't the brightest in the box, are they? Now, for mythical comparisons... There are a few we can compare the Sphinx to, such as the Manticore from Greek mythology. I covered these ages ago, but these are another Greek hybrid monster, with significantly different animals making up their hybridness, such as a goat, snake, lion and eagle. They are equally ferocious, however they're not particularly known for their smarts. Another example is the griffin, which is another Greek hybrid, being made up of the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. They were more intelligent and were also very often linked to European royalty. And these are probably the most similar to sphinxes, as they would be often found lazing around in the sun with their winged lion bodies, but you wouldn't be able to have a civilised conversation with one, unfortunately. I've not actually done an episode on these legendary monsters yet, but it is on my to-do list. 
but let's head over to modern media where we have a load of sphinxes because they're a great trope in any mythical media and are almost overused in video games so there's that for art have a look at caresses by fernan knopf from 1896 Oedipus and the Sphinx by Gustave Moreau from 1864, or Oedipus and the Sphinx by Jean Auguste Dominique Ingres from around 1827. Otherwise, check out Independent and DD art for this one. They're all pretty cool. And duh, if you can go see the actual Sphinx, go see it. It's an incredible feat of human creation. In movies, We have Gods of Egypt, Hercules, The Mummy, Aladdin, Pleasant Goat and Big Bad Wolf, Mirror Mask, Oedipus Rex and The Neverending Story. For TV, we have Monster High, Xena Warrior Princess, Beetlejuice, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, Hercules, The Adventures of Puss in Boots, The Mummy, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Star vs. the Forces of Evil, the Legend of Vox Machina, Danny Phantom, Extreme Ghostbusters, Ultraman Ace, Class of the Titans, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, Fate Slash Prototype, Digimon Adventure, One Piece, and Unico. In video games, we have ones such as Dragon Dogma 2, Heroes of Might and Magic, Banjo Kazooie, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, King's Quest, God of War, Chrono Cross, Final Fantasy 1 and 8, Age of Wonders, Fate Slash Grand Order, Poseidon, Master of Atlantis, Fantasy Quest, Shadowgate, The Page Master, Red Earth, Last Armageddon, Age of Mythology, Shin Megami Tensei, Mythic Blades, Will Rock, EverQuest, The Buried Sea, Earthbound, Rhyme, Lego Marvel Super Heroes 2, Persona 5, Injustice 2, Assassin's Creed Origins, Tomb Raider The Last Revelation, Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy, Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap, Time Machine and Super Mario Odyssey. My book recommendation for this week is for Sphinx Mystery, The Forgotten Origins of the Sanctuary of Anubis by Robert Temple for the mythological and literal Sphinx or for more the mythical view, for Egyptian myths, I recommend the Egyptian Mythology Bible, Discovering the Secrets of Egyptian Myths by Thomas Hedlund, and for Greek myth, Greek myths meet the heroes, gods and monsters of ancient Greece by the lovely Jean Menzies. Oh, but now it's time for... Do I think they existed? I'm so sorry. Do I think there's a slightly sexy cat lady out there giving out free riddles? Probably not, but it was nice to dream, I suppose. And don't give me that look, we all know how everyone feels about Catwoman from Batman. Joking kind of aside, we know that the Sphinx was so ingrained into mythology within the Eastern European and East African world that they married two mythologies so intensely that people don't even know which one they came from which is a testament to its believability on its own. And so much so that there is still one of the biggest structures in the world carved and missing a nose in their honour. So big up the ancient Egyptians and Greeks for that. I've never been lucky enough to go to Egypt, although I would absolutely love to go for the pyramids and the Sphinx, and it is well worth it for one of the original Seven Wonders and for something so ingrained into culture and mythology that it still stands and is beloved around 4,500 years later. What an absolute feat. I guess though, to finish, I must ask the most famous riddle of them all. What goes on four feet in the morning, two feet at midday and three feet in the evening? It's obviously a human dummy. If you know any riddles, it should be that one. Jeez. And yeah, that was my my adaptation on the original one. (laughs) But it's a really good pub quiz question. If you don't know it, you should. But what do you think? Did the Sphinx perplex travellers across the world with riddles? Let me know on Twitter. I would love to know what you think. I love this monster. It's one of my absolute favourites and I'm thrilled that we covered it. 
I will also state at this point that the Sphinx as in the monster and Sphinx as in the hairless cat are spelt two different ways and I thought they were interchangeable but they're not. So for anyone listening, Y is for the cat, I is for the monster. You will thank me at that pub quiz one day. Next week though, we're heading over to the beautiful islands of the Philippines for a super interesting monster with a neighing disposition. See if you can tame the wild and weird tick balang with me next Thursday, and hopefully I'll be sounding a lot better than this. For now though, thank you so much for listening, it's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you are listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next, and I'd love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok, YouTube, Threads, and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast, and the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can be found at MythMonsters.co.uk, including some very cool merchandise. And you can find us on Good Pods, Buy Me a Coffee, and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast too. Come join the fun though, share this with your pals, they might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky. And I'll see you later, babes.